Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first Jamf Security Lounge. I'm super excited to be hosting this very first fireside chat, which dedicates to speaking to security, where we bring on industry experts and start to dive into how uh, we can help you uh, mitigate the risks and get some education around uh, cybersecurity for your organization in your role. My name is Aaron Webb, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Security here at Jamf. Um, and just to let you know that we have got captions during this uh, webinar this afternoon. So if you look at the captions next to the chat window, we have it available in German, Italian, Spanish and French. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very first guest to the Jamf Security Lounge, Fabio Vigiani. Welcome, Fabio. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm super envious of your background like you're in a fantastic studio i'm here in my home office uh you make me want to go and decorate my home office and get that really uh fantastic ambience that you've got there behind you so super envious on my side i'll uh, i'll give that feedback to to the people that have set this up <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's great to have you here can you just give us a bit of background about um who you are and your background in cybersecurity? yeah of course uh so my career in cybersecurity started about 10 years ago when I joined TrueSec actually, and I'm still at TrueSec today after about 10 years. Uh, and But I don't think I've done the same thing for more than two years, probably. Uh, I've changed different roles over this time. So uh, I started doing uh, uh, security assessments, penetration testing, primarily like web application penetration testing, because I had some background in, in uh, web development. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, that grew into more uh, complex uh, type of security assessments all the way to uh, like full red team exercise where we basically tested uh, all the angles of, of uh, uh, well, when you test in a red team, you cover anything from social engineering, attacking users, but also infrastructure, networks, cloud, uh, physical intrusion into buildings to plant devices behind printers and stuff like that. Um, uh, so that's what you would call the offensive security uh, space. Uh, then for a couple of years, I've done a lot of incident response. Uh, started back in, uh, in 2016, we had uh, some of the big cases like Cloud Hopper, for example, that we were investigating. And uh, uh, from there, myself, I've done a lot of incident response. Uh, so I was a technical lead for the investigation and forensics part of an incident response. Uh, after that, uh, well, we built the SOC, so uh, um, detection and response. So I was uh, working a lot with, uh, you know, setting that up uh, and also working as a, like, I don't know, level uh, three or level X to the operators in the in the SOC. Um, then after that, I've done uh, some work in threat intelligence. So uh, basically an analyst, but also trying to use all the data we have from incident response and our monitoring and do further analysis there following the threat actors uh, from a very technical perspective. Um, and uh, since uh, a few months back, I'm a CTO at TrueSec. So uh, I don't have uh, as much my hands deep in the, you know, the action anymore, although I still see the, you know, the team working on it. So I'm, I'm still involved, but I don't do that much myself anymore. Now it's, it's more about um, uh, making sure that the, uh, that what we deliver to our customers uh, is efficient, makes sense. We have a lot of, you know, all these areas that I mentioned, uh, there is, you know, good learnings and data to get from there. We want to make sure that, you know, that flows well, we enhance different services and we give that offering to our customer and we actually keep what we do um, efficient and, and bring value to, uh, you know, solve the problems we see in all these areas. So that's a, yeah, summarized uh, version of how I got here. Such a great journey and hearing all those different aspects of cybersecurity that you've been in over time and leading up to where you are now as CTO of TrueSec. Is there anything that you miss and sometimes you're like, oh, I wish I could just jump into that part or you have to sort of take a step back? Is there anything that you go, oh, I just really want to get hands on on, on that type of aspect? Well, that, that's hard to tell. I mean, uh, I've changed a lot, so I, I haven't got bored in that sense. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we basically do all angles related to cybersecurity. So if I, if I wanted to do something other than cybersecurity, this would probably not be the right place and I would have to look for something else. But at the moment, I don't I don't feel that need. We have a lot of work to do and uh, it's exciting. So uh, no, I don't really miss anything right now. 
Excellent. Great stuff. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, so throughout this whole webinar, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll come to those questions uh, if, they, if they make sense to do that throughout. We don't want to disturb the flow of the conversation, but if not, we'll come to the Q&A at the end. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into some of the content that we've got. So um, such a ri rich background you've got there of expertise, and I'm super excited to have you join us today. Um, can you share some of your insights into the threat landscape of 2023? And I think if you could give us five uh, threats that you're seeing and what our audience should do to sort of um, uh, expect to be prepared for 2023. And this comes at a great time because I think you've just launched your threat intelligence report for 2023 at TrueSec. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So we do that once a year uh, to, around this time, towards the, the beginning of the year. So we released one yesterday, yes. Uh, so... Uh... We can put the link later in the chat, right? So yeah, perfect. Um, we'll drop the link in there for you so you can catch it. But in terms of your top five um, threats for twenty twenty three, what would be your your top five that people should be concerned for for for, for this year? Right. So I think picking five is a little bit hard because it depends on what level you you want to stay. If you want to be very high or quite deep, and I think. Uh, I mean, if I say ransomware, I'm pretty sure that's quite obvious to to most, uh, and uh, that's definitely the the top uh, threat when it comes to businesses of all types and sizes. Really, it has evolved dramatically uh, over the last two or three years. Uh, but to be fair, if I just say, say ransomware, it doesn't say too much to be honest, because ransomware is normally a complex attack. Uh, or there are many stages. If, I mean, ransomware per se is a piece of malware that encrypts data, right? It locks down systems, and then they're going to ask uh, to pay for a key so you can unlock or decrypt the data, right? Uh, so if we just talk specifically about ransomware as malware, uh, if you say you detect ransomware, well, you're basically detecting the final stage of a pretty complex attack. Uh, so when I say, you know, a big threat is ransomware, I don't mean just the final stage. I mean, that's going to be the impact you have. But honestly, we need to look at all the other steps. How did it get there? Because there isn't just one way to perform a successful ransomware attack. Uh, so I'd rather be a bit more specific and say uh, a, a big threat we see is exploitation of vulnerabilities. And specifically, uh, so-called one-day or end-day vulnerabilities, as opposed to zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, so in a zero-day vulnerability, basically that's when, when there is no patch and the vendor normally doesn't even know that there is a vulnerability in a software. So uh, whoever has the exploit uh, or the way to, to uh, leverage that vulnerability, they can do that basically without anyone else uh, having a chance to, to mitigate it. Uh, a one day or end day vulnerability is when there is a patch, but you as a potential victim hasn't haven't had time to patch your systems yet. And that's a very that's a sweet spot for cyber criminals because first of all, they get a heads up that oh, there is a vulnerability in this software, in this product. And they typically go for you know this big common products and like common VPN uh, solutions or common email systems, you know, products that a lot of companies and organizations use. Uh, so they know there is a published vulnerability and there is a patch. So uh, they reverse that patch. They will basically look for what vulnerabilities is this patch fixing? And then they will try to build an exploit for it. And they are becoming very fast in doing that, at least for certain types of vulnerabilities. So sometimes after patch is released, after just a few days or sometimes even hours, but normally it takes a few days, if the exploit is not too complex to build uh, until they have a working exploit, which means you have very short time to patch systems. You can't really wait until the next patch window because they're going to be faster than that. Uh, yeah. And we have clearly seen this increasing uh, a lot over the last couple of years. We have some statistics as well. And in the report, you have those numbers too. I don't have them all off the top of my head, but this is certainly one of the most uh, common ways to get in. Uh, so that's definitely a big, a big threat, uh, which really has to do with, with how quickly you can patch, especially internet facing systems, uh, and also yeah. selecting the ones that are more important to patch. That's another area that I could speak an hour about how to be pragmatic in 
not try to fix all possible vulnerabilities, but identify the vulnerabilities that matter and fix those first. Uh, maybe we can, uh, yeah, go back to that later if we get into that type of topic during our discussions. But yeah, yeah. So vulnerabilities, ransomware yeah. vulnerabilities. Uh, I would definitely add uh, in this time that we use so many like external services, SaaS services, uh, different vendors of different types. Uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, your data is going to end up in many different systems. You don't always have, uh, or you rarely have control of all of your data. Um, uh, you may have a, a better or, or worse idea of how secure your vendor is, but still some data is going to be out of your control. Uh, so, uh, a, a, a big risk is that your data is compromised because one of your vendors is compromised. Yeah, that's certainly something that I think everyone can recognize. Uh, mm -hmm. If I were to ask any organization, you know, uh, can you name all the systems and all the vendors that handle this type of data that is classified in a certain way for your business? Uh, I think that's a hard question to to answer, at least yeah. to answer it, uh, you know, in a detailed way and that you're actually confident in what you're answering, then everyone can say anything. Um, then. Um, um, another big type of attack that is certainly a threat for 2023, and it's been that for, for a few years, uh, is so-called business email compromise attacks. Those are in a way less sophisticated because they only target uh, mailboxes and, and people. So it doesn't really have to do with compromising an entire infrastructure, taking over systems, doing encryption like ransomware, but it's more like... You get access to a mailbox, uh, normally selected uh, people, depending on their role, for example, uh, you know, CFOs or people handling uh, monetary transactions, invoices, things like that. And then uh, they basically hijack conversations uh, where uh, payment information is exchanged. And they basically, uh, you know, wait for the right time and say, oh, no, actually use this other bank account instead or use my other company to make this payment or whatever. And so they're not as technically sophisticated, but extremely successful. And it's a big chunk of the incidents that we've been uh, that we've been responding to lately. And it's so targeted as well, because it's taking those, as you say, those specific job titles and it's having that awareness in the organization to know where there's going to be a change in some of those things. And sometimes they're not aware of that, just changing a conversation because it's a compromise that they're not expecting and it's part of their normal everyday workflow. Right. But the thing is that this is so successful that it's also been evolving a lot. They have reinvested a lot of that into making the their system more efficient. There is, they have a lot of automation, actually, uh, to identify the right people, the right conversations, the right emails and threads to hijack into um and you can you can clearly see that because if you take a, a few different cases and you look at the modus operandi you compare the timelines you see all the events it's quite clear that it follows a very well defined playbook uh and they have people specialize in different areas you have people maybe specializing in the initial phishing campaigns try and get as many as possible you have the, the ones specializing in uh, uh, gathering all the data collected from the mailboxes and and then do the actual conversation um, yeah, so it's, uh, I don't see any reason why that should slow down in 2023. Yeah. What would you be your final two that you would say for, to round out the, the list? Um, DDoS, so the distributed denial of service attacks is, I mean, it's nothing new. Uh, but again, thinking about the, uh, the evolution of, um, of the cyber criminal ecosystem, uh, it's very easy to buy DDoS as a service now. So you don't need to set up your own infrastructure. You don't need to create your botnet to launch the, to launch the attacks from. Uh, if you have a couple hundred bucks, or uh, you know, depending on how much load you want to put, the cost is going to be different. But if you pay, someone else is going to carry out the attack for you, or you can rent an infrastructure for that money and and then launch the attacks. And we've seen this used a lot uh, lately. I mean. Uh, particularly in the region where I'm at, in Sweden and the North Europe right now, uh, there is a lot of these attacks. We have the attacks from the anonymous Sudan, for example. Uh, we've been quite public about that and, and exposing that as a more of an information operation than than uh, than hacktivism, if you will. It's a different topic. 
but uh, definitely more more popular to do uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, we also see that in the context of ransom attacks, because not all ransom attacks are ransomware based. Uh, you can uh, we see several groups that uh, these are normally less sophisticated groups, but they basically start uh, doing uh, DDoS attacks. So they bring down some sites of their targets, and then they just ask for ask for money to stop. So like, yeah, if you don't pay us, uh, we will continue attacking you. It's normally, you know, those are kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of lame attacks, to be honest. I mean, it's pretty, there are DDoS protections that work uh, for this type of uh, low sophisticated attacks, which are not even that expensive. So uh, it's not the type of, uh, I wouldn't see that many victims to actually pay uh, this type of criminals. Do you, do you see a pattern in who they're going after? Is there that low hanging fruit or a particular industry that they're attacking with these sort of like low level attacks? Is it like education, for example, or healthcare, or is it just across the board that they're just trying everyone uh, in it? I mean, it's a little bit all over the place because it depends on the actor, but uh, they normally go for. Um, availability sensitive type of businesses that it actually matters a lot if they're down for a couple hours uh, and of course type of businesses that probably can pay uh, but it needs to be also the right threshold for this low level type of attacks if you go for you know big uh, enterprises they probably have enough uh, you know DDoS protection that they can pay for to already be protected for this type of uh, attacks as a service Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is not the the type of attack I would worry the most, but certainly having at least a sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, how do you say, well, a pretty standard DDoS protection gets you a long way for these type of attacks. Yeah. And your final one for 2023 that people should be aware of? DSA 4, 5. <laughs> five. <laughs> <I don't remember. laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you say? Oh, well, uh, one thing that I should definitely mention is uh, uh, credentials for sale on darknet marketplaces because we see that a lot, and it's been uh, uh, it's been the uh, the reason or uh, yeah, it's been the reason why many of the attacks that we responded to actually started because uh, we can sometimes trace it back all the way to the credentials that were leaked and sold and then. Uh, purchased by a threat actor and used to get into the corporate environment and do whatever they need to do, which in most cases is ransomware. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely a threat on the on the list for 2023 to uh, expect expect some of your credentials to be sold on uh, on some marketplace in the darknet. I think there's so much from that that's just surprising at the speed of which things are happening the sophistication of which they're adapting to the the, the attacks to to get the information and the and the money out of that and we'll come on to a bit more about how the cyber criminal activity works in in a bit but i just wanted to just sort of jump to something that's sort of a hot topic at the moment and and really go to um to, uh, budgets and obviously economic climate is rocking the world at the moment and businesses are trying to save money by various means whether that be sort of a freeze on hiring and we see some large tech companies obviously announcing redundancies already this year but what are you seeing in terms of cyber security budgets and spend on protecting company data and mitigating against risk yeah i mean Compromised companies are all over the place. It's very hard to justify decreasing the cybersecurity budget these days. Uh, but of course, some, you know, you want to try and become more efficient in how you spend that, right? So, yeah. uh, I mean, typically, thing we see is, you know, reevaluating: do we need all these tools? Can we maybe consolidate some of these tools, some of these vendors? Um, which is, uh, yeah, which is a common approach uh, to be more. Uh, uh, effective and efficient from a, from a financial perspective. But to be honest, I think that's a good thing in terms of um, in terms of having a cybersecurity vendor or number of vendors, it becomes harder if you have that type of work scatter many scatter over many different vendors, uh, not just for cost reason, uh, but it's more for having a holistic perspective around 
uh, around your your cybersecurity posture uh, in general as a business. Uh, I mean, whoever handles your vulnerabilities or whoever handles your uh, monitoring for cyber incidents or incident response or uh, you know, infosec work. I mean, ideally, that should be all considered together when you take strategic security decisions, right? If you have those in silos in different vendors or even different parts of the organization that don't talk to each other, then you lose the opportunity to take very informed and strategic decisions at a higher level as well. And you're probably going to save some money as well. So it is something that we see, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, then I think it's becoming more and more obvious for businesses that doing the whole spectrum of cybersecurity in-house is very complex. Uh, so you want to have ideally one or at least very few cybersecurity partners that can that you can outsource that to. It's kind of like uh, you know outsourcing IT or outsourcing cybersecurity. You don't want to have to do that all in-house because not only is often expensive, but you also need the expertise to do that. Uh, and you can only train to respond to attacks so much within your business. Uh, and if you do, it's for some specific cases you handle. But ideally, you want someone that has experience for handling all kinds of incidents all the time to respond to your incidents as well. So ideally, that's the spot you want to be. And then, of course, it's, uh, it, it's possible to find a, more of a hybrid system. So you have an in-house team if you're large enough and you have maybe a partner either for advisory or as an extended team. So anything is possible and finding the right balance there can help both uh, from a budget perspective and, uh, and from an efficiency perspective. Yeah, I think that echoes what we've seen at Jamf, the consolidation of vendors and that holistic approach. It's definitely something that mm -hmm. the market's moving to more towards. And I, I echo what you're saying about the communication between not, uh, not working in silo. So in order to have a really robust cybersecurity plan and, and affect change and have a strategy, you need to have that communication that will not work in silo. So mm -hmm. echo everything you say. In terms of, um, so that's great background about uh, like the type of attacks to expect, um, the economic challenges we're facing globally. Um, but all of that is just like reinforcing and fueling more cyber criminal activity because obviously people have obviously like not prepared for this or they need to outsource things or they're looking at ways to defend themselves and not got the right tooling in place. So could you go into a bit more detail about what the cyber criminal activity looks like and the ways in which an attack takes place? Right. So we can go quite specific into how the attacks look like, which I think is interesting. It's also interesting to try and zoom out a little bit and see how yeah. the how the cybercom world works uh, on a on, on an overall level and how it's evolving. Uh, but if we start with looking at how the attacks look like, I mean, like I mentioned, the, the the majority of the attacks that we see are ransom attacks, most of which are ransomware based. Other type of ransom attacks are you know blackmailing in other in different ways, like you do a DDoS uh, attack uh, or um, uh, there are actually groups that have stopped using the ransomware and just uh, stealing data uh, from their victims and then threatened to release that. Uh, and, you know, they want money for not releasing it. The, those are actually usually in combinations. You do, it's called a double ransom attack, which is really now the standard. Uh, so you both encrypt the data and you steal it and threaten to release it, which is another leverage to get that payment, right? Uh, but there are some groups that are, that are skipping ransomware altogether and just go for data theft. It's less work. And uh, depending on the type of business you're, you're attacking, it can be a lot more effective to threaten to release their data than actually locking their system. Because uh, companies are also getting better than doing backups. Uh, it's taking several years to get there, but we're getting there at some point. Um, but yeah, that's a common type of attack. Then, like I mentioned, business email compromise, another one, uh, and definitely a, a large number of what we call access harvesting campaigns, uh, which can be a lot of phishing, a lot of distribution of malware to uh, get infected computers to connect to large botnets, which are then sold to other actors. Um, when it comes to uh, entry points or initial access vectors, technically speaking, which is, uh, you know, how the threat actor got in the first place to conduct the rest of their attack. Uh, exploiting vulnerabilities, it's at the top. 
there actually we have three main ones which are maybe it's about the third each uh if you want to have the right numbers in the report but uh there's three that is definitely the, the biggest one is vulnerability exploitation like i mentioned before especially one day vulnerabilities so there is a patch but you haven't had time to apply it yet and you're attacked Sometimes those are very old vulnerabilities, maybe some kind of asset that was exposed there. No one even knew it was exposed. Classic situation um, and things like that. And then uh, uh, phishing is definitely another big uh, initial access vector. Uh, it's been there for quite some time. Uh, and then you have uh, what we call remote access services. So like VPNs, uh, remote desktop gateways of different types. Uh, so anything that is a way to get remote access into a, an internal network of some sort. Uh, and in those cases, they usually come with just valid credentials to log on, which often they're taken from marketplaces in the darknet. Um, so that's if we look at how the attacks normally start. Uh, then uh if we look at how the typical ransomware attack looks like they normally go in with one of these three methods and then they escalate their privileges within the internal networks uh until they have the uh you know the highest privilege possible normally like some kind of administrator to most if not all systems and it could be you know if you're in a windows environment that's typically like a domain admin or it could be um an admin to the hypervisor platform where all the virtual machines are running. So any type of access that gives you pretty much control of all the systems, then they look for data to steal. Um, and they're pretty good at automating that as well. Uh, they look for your backups and they either encrypt them or destroy them. Uh, and then they encrypt all of the systems. And it's quite common that they go to the hypervisor and uh, shut down all the machine, the virtual machines and encrypt it from the hypervisor level. Uh, they even have a, a cross-platform uh, ransomware that runs both on uh, on Windows and Linux and others. Well, primarily, primarily, I mean, the common platforms are Windows and uh, ESXi because uh, so then they can do it on the hypervisor level. Um, so that's, that's normally the types of uh, stages of a ransomware attack. Um, and if you look at the timeline of a typical attack, uh, I, I like I like to look at uh, four milestones because that kind of sets the stage for uh, how your security work impacts the attack timeline. I like to look at it that way. So yeah. if I implement something, how does that affect the attack timeline? I think it's a, it's a good way to look at it. So you start from a time before the attack, obviously, then you have the first system or the first asset or account compromised. That's the first milestone. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's used immediately because uh, often that's part of, uh, like I said before, an access harvesting operation. So that access is going to be sold. Um, so you normally have a delay. It can be hours or even days or even weeks sometimes until that access is actually used by someone to do something. And that's when they start to actively try to escalate uh, their access and privileges in the in the environment. Uh, and the sad part here is that in most cases, it takes between a couple hours and a couple of days to go from, from that place to having uh, full control of the environment. Because uh, normally you exploit quite like standard type of vulnerabilities that get you full access in a pretty short amount of time. That's the sad part. Uh, so that's another milestone, the time that they have those privileges. Uh, then they're going to do whatever they, they want to do, exfiltrate data and eventually encrypt. Uh, and you know, in the cases where we do incident response for, that also the time where the victim has detected the attack because they were encrypted. Ideally, you want to detect it earlier, right? And then you respond yeah. to that. Uh, so looking at these times is quite interesting also to understand the uh, uh, the whole ecosystem behind the attack because uh, it has changed quite a lot in uh, in the last couple of years because up until I think it was 2018 is where the so-called big game ransomware started to to appear on the scene because before that ransomware was just a user was downloading some malware executing it their files were encrypted maybe some network share was encrypted. 
they asked for a couple hundred bucks. That was ransomware uh, a few years back. But then at some point around 2018, I think someone had the brilliant idea of, well, let's first take over the entire network and then do ransomware on all the systems and ask for a lot, a lot more money instead. And that took off. Uh, and they started building, you know, what we call now ransomware as a service. So you have a core group that develops and build the ransomware, but they are not the ones doing the attacks. They have affiliates, which are other groups of criminals that can subscribe to or, uh, yeah, join this uh, uh, program, if you will. And uh, they are given the ransomware. They can personalize it. They can uh, decide how much to ask. And then they... They go and get access to their victims. They do the deployment of the ransomware. And then the victim just has to deal with the core group uh, for payments and negotiations and payments. Those are some of the core components. So you have the ransomware group. You have the affiliates that do the attack. And you have the victims. Uh, but this evolved even more because now you have uh, the affiliates don't even get the initial access themselves. Uh, there are groups specializing in just gaining access to victims uh, and then sell that. And those are the, the so-called uh, access brokers. And that's also a huge market. And each type of group specializing that. So you have very specialized groups that just focus on getting access and sell that. Then you have ransomware affiliates that buy that access and just do the escalation inside the environment, and then the deployment of the ransomware. And then you have the core group that handles negotiation and payment, which often also go through some payment company. And then they also have the exfiltrated data, and there is a huge market for selling that type of data as well. And there is so much money going into that, that so more groups going into it, the more specialized groups appear. Uh, so it's, it's really... It's more of an enterprise today than just a yeah. criminal gang, as we used to call them a couple of years back. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how so much of that comes together. All these different actors are coming and playing off of each other. And um, we're obviously talking about the whole threat landscape, like regardless of the devices that you've got. And there's a, a couple of questions in the chat around Jamf obviously focusing on, on Mac and, and, and Apple devices and securing uh, managing Apple at work. We do have security solutions now that do span into other areas of the market. So, for example, our mobile security is not just about Apple. It's also about Android. And it brings me on to a good question for you in terms of BYOD, because so many organizations take precautions um, on their corporate owned devices. But what are you seeing where there's a BYOD offering or, or simply an employee using a, a personal device to access corporate data and systems? Mm. Yeah, what I mentioned before about like stolen credentials being sold, um, it's kind of connected to this topic because many times, if you don't have a visibility on a device, uh, or let's put it this way, if you do it, if you if you put a lot of effort in creating visibility in the devices that you manage, uh, if you have you know monitoring tooling can be EDRs or other solutions, uh, that's great. And normally, when you have a, a breach or intrusion of some sort, uh, you should be able to see that. Uh, the problem is when when people start using non-centrally managed devices or at least devices where you don't have enough visibility to realize that you've had some sort of intrusion, uh, then uh, if those devices are also used to access corporate resources, uh, then your corporate credentials are going to be out there without you even knowing it. And you have no way to see that until they are used, which is when it's too late. And so one thing is talking about credentials, because you can you could argue, and that's true, that you, you should and could have uh, a lot of protections around authenticating to your services. You know, anything for, you know, you want to be very strict, things like conditional access or whatever you want to call them in different solutions but the point is you want to verify that uh that the user is is really the the the, the real person that is supposed to access that service and it can be multi-factor in different ways can be hardware tokens can be codes whatever uh maybe you need to come from the right device and such but if you allow those types of connections from 
either private or at least non-centrally managed devices where you don't have that visibility, then it doesn't really matter how strict the authentication is. Uh, if you have an established session from that device that was originally established by the real user, then they can just hop onto it. So the, you need to have multiple layers. Yeah. So we we need to have all that type of restriction in authentication and everything, but you you still should not trust the devices even though they originally were authenticated by the right user. Yeah, it's something that we're seeing all the time that layers of security and something that we at Jamf talk about quite a lot, which is trusted access and having that layered approach to security and. Uh, if anyone's interested, go and hop over to jump.com and check out um, our trusted access uh, solutions and how we speak to trusted access because it speaks about management, endpoint, identity comes together. Um, and it's not just about what you do on those Apple devices. And Apple's obviously got some great security right at the box and jump layers on top of that. But it's those devices and what they're exposed to uh, in your organization and the type of um, organizational business data that they're accessing and, and the type of vulnerabilities that they might be exposed to. So I love... I, 100% hearing uh, what you're saying and, and, and totally agree with that. Um, in terms of, um, and also as well, I know a lot of people are saying about um, dropping in here. Obviously, Jamf is, is uh, mainly focused on Apple. If you want to go and see some of the stuff that we've got, we've got some more stuff coming uh, in, the, in the media um, shortly, and we'll do more of these um, around uh, fireside chats around some Apple-specific um, sort of security as well. But go and check out our Jamf Threat Labs. Uh, we just uh, published a, um, a, a piece yesterday on some threats that we found uh, on Mac as well. So if you're looking for some of that, please check us out. Uh, but just today, we're focusing on the wider threat landscape uh, with Fabio here. So thank you very much. So in terms of that brings us on nicely, yeah, we've got about sort of a few minutes to wrap up. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, um, I spoke about trusted access, but ZTNA is a hot topic. And uh, at the moment with the threats that you've described, it's certainly justified, but uh, what you see in the market implement and move towards to ensure data and endpoints and connections are protected? Right. So there is definitely a a focus on uh, on having all this uh, this different layers that we spoke about. So starting from uh, hardening the endpoints, uh, which can be done in different ways, and also restricting all the authentication. Right. Uh, and identities become more and more important especially now that it's not so much about you know being a device in an internal network because we you know we, we work with a lot of cloud services you need to carry your identity on internal and external services you still need to be secure you need to be authorized to the right things and so so your identity is a key basically if you want to look at it that way that you bring around with you and it becomes very very important uh to keep that safe regardless of where you are that's i guess then i guess people interpret zero trust in different ways but yeah. to me the concepts are not new right we've been sp yeah. speaking about this for for a long time and you know i perfectly fine we put it under the umbrella of zero trust but again it's about not really trusting <laughs> uh <laughs> where something is coming from right so uh we've been saying that uh, years ago already where when still the uh, the uh, the old way of doing perimeter security, right? If you're in the internal network, you're trusted. Well, I think we're way past that now, but it's also about uh, now that's translated into what's your services and what's third-party services that you still trust, right? So how do you handle that? Because you have that level of complexity now, uh, like identities and multi-cloud environments and different vendors, applications inside and outside. So I'm 100% for... Uh, for pushing that type of hardening and multi-layer security, which is also, back to your question, is what we see companies doing more and more, which is great. But I go back to what I said before, you still can't really trust that device, even if it's a legitimate device and if it was authenticated by a real user to begin with, uh, because that can be compromised and then whatever channel is already open or whatever session is already established to a real service, it can just be used by a threat actor. And then you would just see that being operating in the exact same way that a legitimate user would. Uh, so it goes back to assuming the breach and make sure you have detection capabilities, even on your trusted devices, 
assume that there is going to be something bad running and ideally you want to detect it as early as possible and mitigate it but some breach is going to happen it's yeah just assume that that i'm gonna i want to make sure that we cover off some questions and there's been loads of pe uh, people dropping some stuff in the chat so thank you very much for doing that for us um so there's a question that's coming here if a patch is released say on the first of january not a great time to release a patch but um probably people are, are mainly off but how long would you wait until applying it and i know some companies have like a 30-day limit or um, before 30 days it has to be applied is that long enough or is that too long and i suppose that maybe depends on the uh, critical severity but in general how long would you sort of say is a, is a time to wait to patch that's a great question uh and I would uh, I would challenge a little bit the way that we've been doing patch management, uh, historically speaking, uh, because it hasn't been so much about deciding which patch, uh, not not as much from a security perspective, at least. Uh, it's it's been more in the terms like it was put here in the question, like what's a good time normally, and there is no good answer because it depends on the type of vulnerability. That's the dimension that we've been missing. Uh, we need to look at vulnerabilities from a from a pragmatic perspective and from a uh, exploitability perspective. Uh, and yes, there is severity for vulnerabilities normally, whether you are detecting that, uh, well, because the system is out of date and your vendor releases a patch or because you have some kind of vulnerability scanning tool or because you do a penetration test or a review of some sort and there is a vulnerability, there is normally a severity that comes with it, which typically tells you how important it is to apply the patch or the fix quickly. However, that's not really uh, considering the threat landscape. Because I want to ask myself, if I find a vulnerability, I want to know, is this a vulnerability that is currently being used by threat actor to conduct their cyber criminal activities? If the answer is yes, you can't wait. Yeah, It's as simple as that. And well, now, of course, I'm simplifying. But conceptually, I want to yeah. look at it as simple as that uh, and that that answers another question that's come in actually about like how do you take priority and exactly what you just said if you know that that's going to be exploited you want to make that a top priority to sort of patch right away so right so i would rather have a lot of different sources uh, of vulnerability identification and then apply a uh, informed decision that has at least some kind of threat intelligence input to it to say, well, first of all, am I affected? That's an obvious one. Uh, am I exposing this in a vulnerable situation? For example, is it exposed to internet or is it uh, somewhere that can impact my systems uh, or at least my important systems? Uh, and then look if it's actually been used and how commonly it's used. Um, and you have these, uh, especially the common products, uh, you know, the very popular ones, you know, big VPN providers or email systems, all of those, those are the ones that are going to be extremely juicy for a threat actor to look into as soon as there is a patch. So those are the ones that you can't wait. And coincidentally, they're usually also the ones that they're quite, uh, they're quite important to your business for, for core operations, at least support operations for, for IT at least. Um, but then you always have the discussion, like, should I risk having a patch, which maybe makes my system unstable? Uh, maybe I want to do it in test first. Maybe I want to put it in production a week later. But then you ask yourself, is it is it better that maybe my system goes down for an hour and I need to revert the patch or that I get the ransomware encryption out of that? So it's a, it's a risk decision ultimately, but I would definitely go for patching it as quickly as possible and live with the fact that sometimes there can be some downtime for a bad patch. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And I think that's answered quite a few questions that we've had coming in the chat around, like, what does it mean to be actively uh, uh, exploited? And, and you've gone into details about that and how you've show, sort of like spoken about the timeline and prioritizing stuff. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, we're coming up close to time. So what would you um, finally we sort of before we wrap? Uh, what would be your top three tips or advice that you would give companies to start mitigating threats that we've spoken about today? Of course, finding just three is hard, but let's, let's, <laughs> I will try. And one is a no brainer. It's detection and response capabilities. Because uh, we can work with hardening and protection as much as we want. We can make it extremely hard. 
to be compromised and for attackers to escalate their privileges. But if we have no way to see that, even if it takes them three months to succeed, we're still not going to see that. So I'd rather start with make sure you see that. So uh, and that's when we talk about detection and response yeah. capabilities. And I always recommend to start from from the endpoints, so EDR or XDR based. And by endpoint, I don't mean just clients, I mean servers too. Uh, instead of uh, starting from a network perspective, uh, like NDR systems. I mean, that's a great complement and it should definitely be there as well. But if you need to start with one thing, I would strongly argue start from endpoints, endpoint. as in clients and yeah. servers, detection and response capabilities, and have uh, ideally have that 24-7. Mm -hmm. Because some of these attacks go, go very fast and you don't want to find out on Monday morning that your systems were encrypted on Saturday. Yeah. Um, or at least you had an initial breach on Saturday and then maybe you were encrypted Sunday night. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's definitely one. Uh, if I need to think of two more, I'm going to repeat about the vulnerabilities, like I said before. So having a yeah. structured way to take informed decision of what vulnerabilities to, first of all, look for and then uh and then mitigate first and it's okay to have a backlog of hundreds of unpatched vulnerabilities if you have assessed that they are more likely not going to be used mm -hmm. because it's impossible to patch them all i have customers saying i have five thousand vulnerabilities every year how do i take that number down and i rather re-ask the question which ones are important to take down it's maybe 200 of those five thousand focus on that um and uh let's see then uh one thing we haven't talked too much about, but it's very much related to ransomware is backups. So look through your backups. It's not just about having a backup that is uh, non-writable from like the typical office network or from any type of your system, because that's what the ransomware uh, groups do. They get access to it. Just imagine if your, if your administrators would want to delete their backups, can they do it? If the answer is yes, then the setup is not right. Um, and also when it comes to backup, a, a, something that we see all the time when we do instant response, we ask, uh, do you have backups? Well, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no, but when they say yes, uh, we ask, have you tested it? And they say yes, but the testing was maybe restore some files, some folders once a week or once a month. It's very different than answering can you restore 300 servers at once now? And normally the answer is no, because no one has ever tested that use case. That's not what typical backups, uh, backup solutions were built for, not to restore an entire data center or, or many data centers spread over the world at the same time because your business is down and you're maybe losing millions every hour you're down. So look at as a backup in that way, if all of your servers were down, would you actually have the capabilities uh, and the capacity uh, to perform that restoration? Uh, and how many days are you okay with being down as you do that? Yeah, I, I think they're fantastic tips. I think there's so much there for people to sort of like watch back. This is obviously a recording as well that people will get after this session as well. So thank you very much uh, to everyone. Thank you. Fabio for diving into such great detail. I think there's so much there to unpick. We could have spoke for a whole day on some of these things and go into so much more detail. So if we haven't got to your questions, uh, we will get back to you. We will um, share Fabio's details in the uh, in the chat as well so you can reach out to him. But we'll obviously pick up a lot of these that we couldn't get around to in the time that we've had here today. So thank you so much for submitting those questions and staying with us as we've gone through uh, our very first Jump Security Lounge. Um, so thank you so much. Like, If you want to see more, and I know people sometimes want to come here and see um, some Mac stuff that we've obviously focused on at Jamf and what we focus on in terms of our management for Apple pieces as well. So don't forget to check out our webinar series that we have. And we, we did a, um, a webinar on the 26th of January. Uh, there'll be a link that dropped in the chat now, and it was about um, our threat trends for 2023. Uh, we've also got one that's coming up um, in uh, March, which is optimizing Mac and mobile compliance. Um, so be sure to check those out. Um, and also, I would just want to plug as well um, our next Jamf Security uh, Lounge session, which will uh, be on the 24th of March. We'll share details. Look out for that on social uh, and in your inboxes um, sh soon. But it will be uh, myself joined by uh, Michael and 2A from Cyberpilot. So we'll be looking at, at the sort of workforce and how we uh, 
make sure that our workforce is the first line of defence in cybersecurity. So thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Any final thoughts before we leave? I know you've got that threat, um, threat report. There's going to be so much more detail in there for people to go and dive into. But thank you so much for joining us today. Any last final thoughts before we wrap? No, I think uh, uh, that report is pretty long. We do have a 10 minutes uh, audio of it. If you just want a short version, I think it's a good start. Uh, otherwise, just uh, it was a pleasure being here. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. If you do fill out the survey, we want to hear about what type of things that you want to hear in the future as well. So if you've got questions, if there's things that you want to hear about from us uh, and the guests, or if you want to be part of the Jamf Security Lounge, please reach out to us. Thank you so much for joining us on the first one. Thank you so much, Fabio, for your time. And we hope you have a great rest of your day and a fabulous weekend. Take care, everyone.